Well, July is firecracker month. So I think it's a great thing that we've had with us last week and continuing through the month a firecracker of an impish minister. Yes, indeed. Richard Levy, Reverend Richard Levy, is our guest act, if you will, for the month of July. An extraordinary experience brought Richard to the awareness that a spiritual journey was his calling. He had reservations on a flight from New York to Miami. Called to make, remember when you used to call on the phone and, and make a confirmation of your air travel? Yeah. It's a while ago. Yeah. And he just has this thought to change his already reserved flight to leave from a different airport have a layover instead of a nonstop on his way to Miami. When he gets home, he realizes the flight he was originally booked on crashed and everyone was killed. So he took that as an invitation in his life to begin an extraordinary journey. That took him through a number of disciplines. Paramahansa Yogananda, Edgar Cayce, Science of Mind. He finally landed in unity. Took him long enough, but thank God he got there and was ordained in 1981. Since then has served churches in Hawaii, California, Washington, and now serves as senior minister. Thank you. Confirmation. In Char uh, Wilmington, North Carolina with his beloved wife, Maureen. We are so blessed that he's got a child on the mainland and a grandchild that he would be happy to come to Hawaii for the month of July to be with us. Our own firecracker elf, Richard Levy, Minister Extraordinaire. Thank you. This talk is called From Expectations to Acceptance. This comes from Abraham, and it says, the best of experiences you must move beyond. The worst of experiences you must move beyond. Know that it's going to be all right no matter what. Let it be what it is. Let it be what it is. I have a very dear friend who's been involved with truth for some 45 years, and he bought a brand new car, for him a new car, and he was driving it from point A to point B. And as he was pulling out from a stop sign going down the road, there was a woman coming directly at him that he would have hit directly head on if he'd not swerved to the left, hit the side of her car, and gone down in a very steep, steep, steep ditch. You all know about the real steep, steep, steep ditch you could end up in. His car was completely, completely totaled. He was bruised, but okay. And a part of him said, why has this happened to me? You know, or that one that says, uh, I didn't expect this to happen. <laughs> How did I attract this to myself? <laughs> Answers that don't really ever come from that except to get yourself a big dose of guilt, shame, and blame. He said, you know, if I had just taken 15 more minutes to leave the house, 15 more seconds to leave the house, 15 seconds to pat the dog on top of the head or to give my wife a hug or, or just spent five seconds at the stop sign, I wouldn't have been there at that moment hitting that car head on. When we look at our life, we see that things come to us that we don't have any control over. Coming down the highway and byway of life, you don't know what you're going to meet next. What you have are spiritual teachings and practices that allow you to meet what happens with consciousness, awareness, and awakening. That's what you've got. Our practices allow us to make choices about how we'll respond to what happens to us, how we can use whatever happens to us to awaken to who we truly, absolutely are. The title for this talk and the idea from it actually comes from uh, my favorite new magazine, ARP Magazine. <laughs> When Art Magazine came to my house 13 years ago, I felt cursed. How you got the wrong guy, not me. Now I read every single article. It's about people like me who are at the end of the dash, <laughs> getting old and achy. I love it. I love it. And this article comes from Michael J. Fox, who talks about his experience of early onset Parkinson's disease. It wasn't what he was expecting to have happen in his life. It wasn't what he treasure mapped for, but it is what 
he got. And this lesson summation comes from a deep sense of presence and knowing the truth that sets us free. He says, there's an idea I came across a few years ago that I love. My happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and inverse proportion to my expectations. Say amen with me. This is the whole talk right here. My, say it with me, my happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and inverse proportion to my expectations. You see what I'm talking about? That's the key for us. If we can accept the truth that this is what we're facing, not what can we expect, but what am I experiencing right now, then we have a whole lot of freedom to do other things. But we don't have that freedom as long as we're lost and expecting it to be different and not like it was, like it should be, could be, shoulda, woulda, and coulda crucify all of our present moments. When we live in the presence of what is and accept what is, we can be aware of what is also present and who we truly are. But you can't have one without the other because there is only one presence and one power. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And so what you're not willing to give to yourself, you can't receive from God because there's only one God. In this moment, if you can accept what's going on in your life right now, a great presence and power opens up to what's also present in this moment, right here and right now. And it begins with the incredibly important teaching of acceptance. There's a tiger called Mohini, a white tiger, at the Washington, D.C. Zoo. And Mohini, you've probably seen this, lives in a 12 foot, 12 by 12 foot, cage. And Mohini, for his whole life, has done nothing but walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over again, wearing out the cement with back and forth, back and forth. That's been Mohini's whole life. There's no other choice for Mohini but to go back and forth. That's our repetitive thought patterns that happen over and over and over again. With no awareness, we don't have a choice. Our rut may be carpeted, <laughs> have TVs, VCRs, and lots of cell phones, but if we're not bringing awareness to what is, we can be just as lost as Mohini is. An exciting moment happened when somebody came up with a whole bunch of money to build this beautiful theme park for Mohini. This beautiful place, two acres with, with ponds and trees and places of shade. Everybody was so excited to give this regal tiger this beautiful space that he deserved. And so the expectation level was really, really, really high. The cameras were there a year and a half later, and they opened up the cage of the repetitive thought pattern and, and introduced Mohini to this beautiful new space, what we call in our teaching the kingdom of heaven consciousness, the queendom of Allah, everything available. And what, what did Mohini do? Mohini walked into the entranceway, found a spot in the back, 12 by 12 foot, and walked back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for the rest of her life. It was too late for Mohini. It's never too late for you and I. <laughs> this is the good news of great joy. I don't care what rut you might be in, where you might be stuck. Oh, I've got Parkinson's disease, and now I'm shaking, and my life isn't working. And oh my gosh, the, the church income is down because the main minister is gone. And oh my, she loves me, she loves me not. You know, all the stuff that goes on over and over and over again with the repetitive thought patterns that you never have to remind yourself to remember. That voice is always speaking to us. Unless we bring awareness to it and just accept, well, this is what I'm experiencing now in time, but it's not the truth of who I am in eternity, you then be present to break out of that rut and experience the theme park that God has given for each of us, custom made for you and me to be the magnificent sons and daughters of God we were meant to to be. That's what our practices are leading us towards. And when we are accepting of where we're at, we can then get much larger than what we're stuck in. Seven weeks ago, I was having a wonderful Monday um, 
I was with my granddaughter in Wilmington, North Carolina. I have a grandson on the Big Island, and I have a granddaughter in Wilmington, North Carolina. People, what, what are you doing in Wilmington, North Carolina? And I said, my granddaughter lives an hour and 45 minutes away. And for those of you who are grandparents, that's all the reason you need, right? That's why I'm there. I'm there because I'm close to her. I can't be close to both. So we're having this great Monday. I started my, my day off with an incredible meditation. I'm existence, consciousness, and bliss, as I said last week. Just that moment where ah, acceptance of the full presence and power of who I truly am. And we went to go for a bike ride, my daughter and I, my, my granddaughter and I. And I remember the bike. There was a little one that I taught her on, and now a bigger one. Now she's, you know, she's real tall now. She's eight. And we're going for this great ride, and then it happened. It was her choosing to make a left turn in front of me. And as she made a left turn in front of me to avoid hitting her head on, I took my bicycle instinctively and just whipped it around like this and found myself um, sliding on the cement, not unlike my friend in the ditch with first my hand and then my elbow, it still hurts, and my hip and my knee and my foot. And lying there on the ground, a part of me said, this was not what I was expecting for this day. Right? How did I attract this to myself? The real question was, I avoided hitting my beautiful, Buddha-filled, Christ-filled granddaughter head on. Head on. And, and it, what was interesting, I'm not naturally compassionate like my, my wife, mid, my midwife wife, Maureen, is. I, I, but I, I looked up, and the first thing I thought of was someone else besides me. That's huge. How are you doing, honey, was the first thing I said. She goes, I'm fine, Papa, but you are not doing well at all. I was covered <laughs> and drenched in, in, in blood. And so I wasn't able to, to do what I love to do, which is I work out. I've been working out every day for 40 years, and I wasn't able to do that for, for weeks and weeks, running six, eight miles every other day. Can't do that either. So the, the wounds have healed up now, but I still have that um, the pain in the, in the hip, and I've got the pain in the knee. And please don't give me your metaphysical, mystical tour. I have been and done everything you could possibly do. It's just going to take time. It's going to take time. So I woke up one morning and I was about to do what I usually do because the bulky two o'clock in the morning sort of pulsating in the, in the hip and, and the knee. And I, I went for my, my favorite item on the shelf in my bathroom, ibuprofen. Thank God they legalized it. Never mind Pacalolo and marijuana being legalized. Thank God they legalized ibuprofen. And before I reached for the bottle, I decided I would, I would practice the presence of the moment. So I, I took my seat at two o'clock in the morning in meditation, and now I can fold my leg up. Now I couldn't do it just even three to four days ago. And I just sat and I, I allowed myself to be present with my pain. The pain in my, in my hip, the pain in, in my knee. And I realized that uh, I was more than just that pain, and I, I wasn't always feeling that stinging pain. That there were moments when I felt no pain at all. And I was just letting myself experience my pain. When you study Vipassana meditation, you don't run away from anything. You accept everything as it is. And then as you do, you begin to realize you're more than the emotional pain you might be going through, the physical pain you might be going through. You're much more than that. But you have to bring yourself to the present moment to experience that. So I just experienced that, my, my pain. And then I thought about my brother, all taped up and bandaged from his time in the ditch, learning everything he could learn from that, because there's a lot to learn from staying in the ditch. You don't want to leave it too quickly. <laughs> yeah. You can learn a lot there. And I thought about his pain. And then I thought about all the people in my congregation who are going through some sort of physical pain. And all of a sudden, my pain and his pain became the pain that we all suffer from while we're in a body. And a great compassion welled up in me. And I was able to just feel a Dalai Lama kind of moment, you know, where everybody becomes part of me. Not just, like we said in the beginning of the talk, the parts I like, but the parts that I don't like. Because both rise and fall, and both come and go. Acceptance, powerful, powerful energy. When I was growing up, I, I bit my, my fingernails. Uh, how many here have the nail biting thing? When I, particularly when I was growing up, I was constantly gnawing at my fingernails. And it drove my, my dad, Alvin, crazy. And he was crazy anyway, so it drove him crazy. And, and you know, I notice as I get older, I look more and more like him. As you get older, you've got to smile more because you just look mad. 
<laughs> and as I'm doing my Alvin routine, practicing this talk, I'm going, oh my God, it's him. He's come. Wow, he's here. And of course he is. He's part of my genetic coding. I've accepted the fact that the older I get, the more I look like my father. Luke, I am your father. And of course he is at a physical level, but I'm more than just that. And we're sitting on this, this subway, and, and there's this guy across from us. We're going from point A to point B. And it's this guy who's got bloody, bloody, bloody fingernails. My father says with his neck popping out, if you keep biting your fingernails, they're going to look just like that guy's hands. I want you to, I expect you, whenever you see your fingers in your mouth, you think about those bloody fingers. And I went, Gah! I didn't swallow my whole arm. That didn't work. And there was a lot more to that biting of the fingernail thing. It had to do with just feeling insecure. I was slow at school. I had slight dyslexia that was undiagnosed at that point back in the 50s. They didn't diagnose it. So I was in the triple I class for the seventh and the eighth grade. And, and being someone who wasn't too bright and smart in Great Nag Long Island with a bunch of Jewish equals was not a great thing. <laughs> Everybody was pretty bright and smart. And I also was one of those kids that I, ne I never felt confident enough with my body to be able to, to be good at sports. So I was one of those, I don't know if you can relate to this, I was one of those kids that always got picked last. You know that feeling? You know, I don't want them, you take them. No, I don't want them, you take them. No, you take them. Yeah, you take them. You take them. So I was dealing with, you know, that. And I, well, the truth is, I'm still just a little boy biting my fingernails. I'm looking for attention. I want you to love me and care about me. That's why I do what I do. I found a way to finally be accepted in front of hundreds of people. But I'm, I'm still there with that. I know I am. I don't physically bite my fingernails, but I'm, I'm chewing and gnawing on myself. Aren't you? That comes with being in a body. We all have that. I'm not trying to ignore that, just to be, to be present with it. And it wasn't until, oh my gosh, 1982, when I was now a unity minister, but I was still a closet nail biter. I was a mystical, metaphysical, meditating nail biter, which didn't look good. So I spent a lot of time like this, you know, because you tell people the peace of God is my one goal, peace be still, and you've got bloody fingernails. Didn't go well together. So it wasn't until I met Wally and Verl Minto. Wally Minto. Remember Wally Minto? He had, a, he had a thing where he said, it's okay to have problems. And they had a lot of problems. <laughs> but the thing that he taught was, and I want to teach this to you now as a main teaching for this particular Sunday, is he said, until you're able to accept where you are right now, you can't accept who you truly are as a child of God. Because the two are the same God. So he said, I want you to take one thing that you've not accepted about yourself. And I'm not talking about bad behavior for yourself or somebody else doing that to you, but some part of you that you're still not accepting, that you haven't allowed yourself to truly accept about yourself. And for me, it was, my finger was in my, and I was kind of my finger now, so it was really kind of easy to see that I could do this. So I, I looked and every time I'd find my hand in my mouth and say, it's okay to bite my fingernails, but it's also okay not to. And I found myself, by bringing awareness to what was going on, biting my fingernails less and less and less. Don't they, they look pretty good right now, huh? I'm really kind of proud of them, because you don't know, for, for years, they, they, were, they were stubs. And knowing that I was doing this talk to you guys again, I had to clean my act up for a couple of weeks, because my, my mohini comes back again. And I'm like, oh, gosh, it, I, the, the, the offering was not good at my church last week, and I thought things would go well, I'm going to be gone. I'm like, oh! And I've got to give a talk on my fingernails. I've got to pretty them up, you know. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to be aware of what's going on in your life, to be present for whatever it is that you're going or growing through in this moment. It's okay to accept those things that you have not accepted about yourself. And the more you can accept things about yourself that you found unacceptable, the easier you are to be around other people because you're not judging them so harshly. I didn't get the mother I expected, but I got the one that I got. We, we moved uh, to the East Coast, and I realized that living in Wilmington, I was going to be 11 miles away from my mother. So I, she's in her 80s, and I thought, I'm going to go visit my mom once a year. Maureen and I are going to take the 11-hour drive. We'll, we'll leave church after the church buzz, which goes on for about three hours, and then you're miserable and hate everybody. Um, <laughs> And, and, and get, get, to the, get to the first hotel and, and stay overnight and then the next day see my mom. And we've done that for three different rounds and the fourth round was coming up and my mom calls me on the phone and says, hello, Richard, it's your mother. 
I said, Mom, I know it's you. No one has that voice like you do. She says, so Joey's getting married this, this October. I said, yeah, well, I'm doing the wedding. Maureen and I are doing it together. So that means, that means you know, you're going to be here for October. I said, yes. She goes, I hope it doesn't mean you're planning on coming twice. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm bringing the dog, the two cats, the litter box. We're staying for a month. She goes, that's, I'm leaving then. I'm moving. So... That is, that's my mother, that's my mother. So we're there and, and we're, we're, we're visiting my mother and we're having, I don't know, sparkling cider or something, glass of wine before dinner. And uh, my, my wife asked the question of my mother, so mom, do you have any regrets in your life? And my mom, without a moment's hesitation, not even an instant said, I never would have gotten married and I never would have had any children. And then she said it again. She said it again. Never would have gotten married. Never would have had any of you. Oh. Oh. Thanks, Ma, for being so honest, Yes. The question, and you get an honest answer. That's my mom. My mom's personality, without spiritual practices, is just the same thing over and over again. Day after day, the repetitive thought patterns. The only thing that we have is we have teachings that say we don't need to keep repeating this stuff over and over again. And what I find is that the more accepting I can be of my mom as she is, without expectation, the more I can love her for who she is. And the more love I get back from her by accepting that this is what I get with my mom. Judging her having expectations that anything in your life be different than what it is, just places you in a mode where you don't see the blessing that's right in front of your eyes. You hear that now? And then what you find, I have found, is there's more moments where, where I find that there's love between my mom and I that was never there before. It was always there. I just was not aware of it. And then when she does one of her little things, I'm not surprised. <laughs> no surprise, she's doing it again. That's great, and I'm getting my buttons pushed, and I'm doing it again. And isn't this great? Over and over again, and I can step out of that imprisoned thought system and awaken to something greater. And then freedom comes from that. Don't you feel that in your own life? So let's take a look at our lesson summation just for a moment. And again, we'll start, uh, Christine, at the, at the beginning again if we can. Here we go. Am I supposed to be pushing a button? Here we are. The best of experiences you must move beyond. And the worst of experiences you must move beyond. Sorry, both are up for grabs. You can't have one without the other. Um, know that it's going to be all right no matter what. So let it be what it is. There's an idea I came across and it says this. My happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and inverse proportion to my expectations. Let's say that together, okay? My happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and inverse proportion to my expectations. The beauty of life is, is that when you can truly accept where you are, you'll get the right assignment for you at the right moment, at the right time. Michael J. Fox has been offered a 24 series new television series. Producers, directors sat down with him and talked about this show and he goes, you know, I can no longer hide my Parkinson's disease. I can't even do one scene without shaking. And here's what God will say to you. Well, guess what, Michael? We have a designed a role for you to star in this role as someone who has Parkinson's disease. Do you hear that now? You and your handicap, the thing you don't think is working, the thing you're rejecting about about yourself, is the very thing God, spirit, energy, essence, can use for you to be of benefit, not just to yourself, but to all beings everywhere. That's what we're here for. That's the good news of great joy. That breaks us out of the theme park of our forgetfulness into our magnificence. That's the key for us. That's the truth. Now I'm facing this. This is true in time, but not in eternity. And the bigger picture from Javi says this. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. And look at what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. This is the power of giving to your life without the burden of expectations. So this week, when you find your fingers back in your mouth again, and you will, oh, please, or you'll notice somebody else doing it. 
I'm much better at that than noticing what I'm doing. Just, oh, well, there I am. I'm, I'm chewing on this situation again. This fear is back. I can just be okay with it, and I can also be okay with not doing it. And then all of a sudden, the very hands that you've been gnawing on become the very hands that can be a blessing and a diksha of oneness for other people. And that's what we're here for, yes? To serve in that way. Let's take a moment to really embody this and just close our eyes for a few moments. I accept myself as I am, a beloved child of the universe. Let's say that together. I accept myself as I am, a beloved child of the universe. I accept all parts of my human life. I accept all parts of my human life. If there's some part of you that feels like it's in a ditch or on the mountaintop, both of them in time will disappear. But who you are can show up any moment when you show up, when you accept yourself as you truly are without the burden of expecting your life to be anything other than perfect just as it is. Let's take a few moments in the silence to breathe in and breathe out the great gift of acceptance. <laughs> 